Welcome to Small Practice Support, information session number 70. In this recording, Simon Trainer discusses with Justin Purcell the new regulation responsibilities of the Law Society and the LSRA. So you're all very welcome to this uh, small practice information session. And I'm joined today with uh, Simon Trainer from the Legal Service Regulation Executive in the Law Society of Ireland. Simon, you're very welcome and thanks for joining us today. Justin, thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you kindly. And um, you're all very welcome. And I hope I can assist in demystifying some of the differences between the society and the Legal Services Regulatory Authority in this session. So... Um, just to begin, um, the authority commenced on the 1st of October 2016, and they first had to address a number of statutory matters that um, included public consultations concerning legal partnerships, matters relating to barristers, and also multidisciplinary practices. Um, while it wasn't part of the statutory requirements, the authority also accepted submissions in relation to limited liability partnerships. They also had to, at that time, cost and evaluate the structure of the complaint system, as well as establishing the role of practicing barristers, because without this in place, the levy provisions of the Act could not be implemented. So the centerpiece of the Act, as you may be aware, is part six, and that concerns the complaints functions of the authority. And that began on the 7th of October, 2019. So, complaints concerning legal services of an inadequate standard or an amount of cost sought by a legal practitioner being excessive may be made by clients only. There's a three-year limit on such complaints being made to the authority, and the authority can also make an investigation of their own initiative where there is no complaint received. So, when complaints are made to the authority there, uh, the complainant is expressly requested to confirm if they've made a similar complaint previously, either to the society or the bar council. And this is obviously to prevent duplicity. So in order for a complaint to proceed, uh, the authority conducts a preliminary view to uh, assess whether the complaint is admissible. They can reject complaints that are frivolous, vexatious, or without any substance or foundation. And then if it passes the admissibility test, the act requires and the authority encourages the informal resolution of complaints between legal practitioners and clients. This isn't like a new system, and it's something similar to what the society would have conducted recently at first instance. However, where there's no agreement reached between the parties to that procedure, the formal written procedure is commenced. Then the authority may make a determination regarding the complaint. And if they determine the complaint is justified, they may issue a number of sanctions against the illegal practitioner under section 60, subsection six, or section 61, subsection six of the 2015 Act. But then there are the higher level of complaints. So complaints concerning misconduct may be made by any person and not just a client. There's no time limits on the complaint of misconduct being made. And the definition of misconduct under the 2015 Act has now been expanded, and it includes actions or omissions which occur otherwise than in connection with the provision of legal services. The act or omission in this case would have to justify a finding that the legal practitioner is not a fit and proper person to engage in the provision of legal services. So we have examples in this jurisdiction where um, a solicitor may have been convicted of uh, an indictable offence and imprisoned. But and a, a good example I always find from a uh, neighbouring jurisdiction in England was a solicitor who evaded train fares to the sum of £650 was subsequently struck off the roll for this. So in these more serious complaints, they are referred to the complaints committee of the authority. The complaints committee sits in divisions of no less than three and not more than five members. 
The complaints committee can require a complainant to verify things by affidavit if necessary. And where the complaint is upheld, the complaints committee can specify certain directions to the practitioner. In more serious matters, the complaints committee may, in its discretion, refer the matter to the lead practitioner's disciplinary tribunal. And the authority also has extensive powers over uh, professional codes and professional code can cover any conduct, rule, regulation, practice note, guideline, or anything else issued by a professional body. The authority is provided with all professional codes from the Society and Bar Council and at its initial stages, the Society and the Bar Council had to provide the authority with all of its professional codes. So the authority can also issue codes of practice which relate to a class of legal practitioners, such as maybe for barristers or solicitors, or they may issue codes of practice that apply to all legal practitioners. But where a code from either the society or the bar council conflicts with a professional code issued by the authority, the authority's code will prevail. And the authority can also review professional codes from the Society or Bar Council, and they may issue a notice to either of those bodies requiring an amendment to the professional code itself. If in the event the notice is ignored, the authority can apply to the High Court for an order to direct the professional body to comply with the notice. And um, as you're probably aware, there are new business structures available under the Act. Um, part eight of the Act permits legal li limited liability partnerships, legal partnerships, and multidisciplinary practices. Looking first at limited liability partnerships, as these are now in place, it's important to note, unlike the English counterparts, uh, it remains a partnership of solicitors under the Partnership Act 1890. It doesn't change a corporate to any kind of a corporate structure. There were initially a small number of applicants uh, who made applications for authorization to the authority who had difficulties with the banks at the outset, but fortunately this has since been resolved. There must be a partnership of solicitors in place at the time of making the application. So one can't make uh, an application for an LLP ab initio, so what one must do is a firm must commence with the law society and be issued with a firm number before making an application for authorization to the authority. The application for authorization is quite a simple process and it's available to view on the authority's website. But it's important to note that any change to the structure of the LLP, such as partners, if they're changing address, any, any kind of changes to those firms, they need to notify the society first and thereafter to the authority. And there's also a dual notification to the society and the authority required when uh, an authorized LLP is ceasing practice. Of course, the limitations on the limited liability partnership model, they prevent, um, any limitations that would include uh, fraud or dishonesty, criminal offences, or any liabilities that would have occurred in the firm prior to the date of authorization. As far as I'm aware at the present, there's approximately 350 firms authorized to operate as limited liability partnerships in the jurisdiction. The next uh, structure are legal partnerships, and they're due to commence in the first quarter of 2022. And there are new structures and the legal partnership is a partnership of legal practitioners where at least one of the partners is a practicing barrister. And these structures will also be eligible to apply for limited liability partnership status once commenced. But the barristers who enter legal partnerships need to be on the role of practicing barristers, which is held by the authority and they're not permitted to be members of the law library. This is set out under the Code of Conduct for the Bar of Ireland, which prohibits its members from entering into legal partnerships. If there are any solicitor partners within the legal partnership, the society's professional indemnity insurance regulations will apply. 
But where the legal partnership is only barristers, the authorities, professional indemnity insurance regulations will apply. Um, barristers who are in these kind of partnerships will continue to require to be briefed by a solicitor uh, in relation to contentious matters, and they continue to be prohibited to hold any client monies. The third structure that comes under the uh, part eight of the act is multidisciplinary practices, and we're currently uncertain where this actually lies. So the legislation in the 2015 act is not particularly detailed in relation to multidisciplinary practices, and it probably needs further clarification for these structures to become viable. Um, both, the, both the Society and the Bar Council provided submissions opposing these structures in 2017, and the authority, when it finalized its report in 20, September 2017, suggested that these structures be put on hold pending the commencement of limited liability partnerships and legal partnerships so it is possible they may take an interest in this uh, going forward. And the 2015 Act uh, requires the authority to do a number of reports. Uh, most of these appear under section 34 of the Act. And this includes an annual report on the admission policies of the professions, the education and training of legal practitioners, there's a recent report published on the unification of the professions, and there's one shortly expected concerning the possibility of uh, creating a standalone profession of conveyancer. Section 34 also gives a discretion to the minister to permit them to request a report from the authority on any matters the interest the minister may, request, uh, may have an interest in. So, for example, the Minister has recently requested the authority to conduct a public consultation on the economic and other barriers faced by young barristers and solicitors with a view to making recommendations. Uh, the authority is also required to provide annual reports on its complaint functions twice a year under Section 73 of the Act. The advertising of legal services was taken over by the authority on the 18th of December 2020 with the commencement of the Legal Services Regulation Act 2015 Regulations 2020. Now, not a great deal has changed uh, in relation to the advertising of legal services, with the exception that barristers are now subject to a statutory regime which they would not have been before. The authority can carry out investigations into particular advertisements of their own initiative, or they can investigate complaints received by members of the public or other legal practitioners, as the case may be. However, unlike the society's previous practice, the legislation does not permit the authority to operate a pre-approval service for advertisements, so legal practitioners are best to keep an eye on the actual regulations themselves in order to make sure they are compliant therewith. The Act uh, sets up an inspections unit, but which, as far as I'm aware, has not yet commenced. But when this does, it provides these inspectors with far-reaching powers to conduct inspections of legal practitioners, either with or without notice to the legal practitioner. The powers provided to inspectors are quite extensive, and if the need be, they may go in with guardee if required. The inspector will then produce a report, and the report may be used as evidence in proceedings taken against the legal practitioner. But of course, all this has to be paid for. And as you're probably aware, the Act provides for the levy. Um, the levy is divided in a way that the bulk of it is paid for by the Law Society of Ireland and the Bar Council of Ireland. Solicitors pay through their annual practicing certificate fees. The formula for the levy takes account of the relative sizes of the two professions and the extent to which each of those professions generates work for the new system. However, any barristers who are on the role of practicing barristers but are not members of the law library are provided with an individual annual levy. 
So the individual levy for barristers will apply whether they are in the role of practicing barristers for a week, for a month, or for a year. There's no method under the Act to prorate the fees. And this also applies for solicitors, as the society is not permitted to prorate the levy payable to the authority. In the event the authority is not paid its levy by any person, uh, the Act provides that the authority has a power to seek payment through the courts of the levy as a simple contract debt. So where does this leave the law society? And the law society can, retains its powers in relation to practicing certificates, uh, in relation to issuing manual practicing certificates for solicitors. And as you'd be aware, applications are continuously made online through the society's website using solicitor number and password. And this will be the case in 2022 as well. The society also retains its control over the regulation of professional indemnity insurance for solicitor firms. Uh, quite a topical thing at the moment, of course, being the 24th of November. So all active solicitor firms are required to have a qualifying policy of professional indemnity insurance in place by the 1st of December in each practice year. This needs to be confirmed through the society's PII portal within three working days. It does not impact the existing right of solicitors who seek to limit liability uh, to clients by way of contract to not less than the minimum level of cover for PII. The society also retains uh, the solicitor's accounts regulations and it continues to be the body to which solicitors should provide their annual accountants reports and where they're ceasing, they should also provide their closing accounts reports to the society. The society can also appoint authorised persons to investigate compliance with the solicitor's accounts regulations 2014 and also anti-money laundering legislation. The society also continues to be the appropriate body to make applications to and for claims on the compensation fund. The compensation fund continues to be funded through the annual practicing certificate fees for solicitors. Um, disciplinary matters for in relation to financial regulation, um, the society is one of the parties that may make an application to the legal practitioner's disciplinary tribunal for its powers under financial regulation. I point out that the unlike the solicitor's disciplinary tribunal, the legal practitioner's disciplinary tribunal is not open to lay applicants and is only open to applications from the authority or the society. The society also may seek to suspend a solicitor's practicing certificate and freeze accounts through a high court application where there is evidence of dishonesty in relation to client monies. The society also continues to take files in in relation to distressed solicitors' practices. And this usually happens where perhaps a sole practitioner is suspended from practice, is struck off the roll, or sometimes where a solicitor who is a sole practitioner dies in practice. And the society will seek a high court application in order to take up the files and have those files distributed to clients or their newly nominated solicitors. And any complaints made to the society prior to the 7th of October 2019, the society is still winding these down. There's only a small number of complaints left with the society at this stage. And there's only one division left of the society's Complaints and Client Relations Committee to finish these uh, complaints off. There are a number of areas of crossover between the authority and the society, as you would expect. And one of these is practicing certificates. And th this arises because the complaints committee of the authority may direct the law society to impose a specified condition or restriction on the practicing certificate of a solicitor in the case of a determination made against that solicitor. Also, the legal practitioners disciplinary tribunal can make a, a direction to the society imposing specified conditions or restrictions on a solicitor's practicing certificate. In relation to complaints, 
Section 59 of the 2015 Act permits the authority, the Complaints Committee of the Authority, or the Legal Practitioners Disciplinary Tribunal to request the Society to conduct an investigation into any matter that is relevant to a complaint. This was uh, designed to replicate a power that the Society used to have under Section 14 of the, Act, the Solicitors Amendment Act of 1994. Now, typically these requests from the authority relate to financial matters, but they could relate to other matters, including professional indemnity insurance or practicing certificate matters. And in the event the society receives such a request from the authority, it's required to provide a report within one month of the receipt of the request. The report issued by the society to the authority is admissible in any proceedings taken under Part 6 of the 2015 Act. In relation to regulations, the society is currently required to seek the consent of the authority into certain regulations. The most significant regulations that the society must seek consent from the authority for include professional indemnity insurance and solicitor's accounts regulations. The voluntary removal of the role of solicitors is now a function of the society, which previously was a function of the solicitors disciplinary tribunal. And all applications for voluntary removal from the role need to be made to the law society. There is only a small number of these applications are made in any one year, but it's usually done for the purposes of the applicant is seeking to be called to the Bar of Ireland. This requires the society to conduct a check of its complaint records and by way of consent from the applicant, we conduct a check of the authority's complaint records to confirm that the applicant is not trying to frustrate any disciplinary matters that may be pending against them. Um, in relation to new business models, there's also a crossover there. Um, because when the authority are commencing a limited liability partnership, for example, the authority needs to be certain that the solicitor partners are practicing solicitors, they are permitted to be a partner, that is to say that there's no conditions against the solicitor on their practicing certificate prohibiting them from being a partner in a firm, and they also require evidence of professional indemnity insurance in place. In most cases, these are provided by the applicant, but there have been occasional times when they need to consult with the society for confirmation of the professional indemnity insurance details. So how do we kind of deal with these areas of crossover? And the way we deal with it is to deal with areas of mutual interest. The Law Society and the Legal Services Regulatory Authority meet every approximately every six weeks. Um, we discuss matters of mutual interest, which could include the matters mentioned above, they could include complaints, the Legal Practitioners Disciplinary Tribunal, data sharing, professional indemnity insurance, and also perhaps unregulated providers of legal services. So overall, I'd say, while it's apparent that we both have our own separate remit as the society and the authority. There remains, and there always probably will be, an area, a number of areas of crossover, which require cooperation between the two bodies so that we can both respect, uh, re operate our respective regulatory functions as intended by the 2015 Act. And um, I think that's everything I'm going to say today without going into too much detail. But I'm happy to take any queries or questions that you have. And um, I'm going to leave my email address here. And I'm happy to take any questions by email as well, if you'd prefer to as well. Simon, that, that's great. That's a really good comprehensive just analysis of, of, of where we're at. So I suppose just a, a, a quick question there is, are you aware uh, of whether there's any likelihood of legal partnerships being set up if and when they are authorised next year? Um, well, we were speaking with the authority recently, and they are of the opinion that it is going to be commencing in the first quarter of 2022. So they should be uh, they should be able to establish, hopefully, early in next year. 
Okay. And so then maybe just can you give examples of minor versus uh, serious complaints under the, the new act? <laughs> well, a minor, uh, I suppose you're looking at something like uh, um, inadequate professional services and excessive fees versus misconduct. And misconduct is defined under section 50 of the act. And there are specified areas there. So um, it, it, it will probably be best to actually review section 50 of the act. And that will give you an idea of what are areas that come into misconduct and they will be considered serious areas. But uh, say for example, criminal offense would, Consider be considered one of the more serious areas. Um, what would you de define as a minor minor misconduct? And a, a question I had is: is does it have to be related to running a solicitor's practice, or it could be how I uh, a bit no, of road rage on the road? No, misconduct is a higher level of uh, than inadequate professional services or uh, excessive fees. Those complaints can only be made by a client. But misconduct is the higher level. It's um, it's it's considered the worst kind of offences that a professional can engage. But are, in. are they offences related to practicing as a solicitor, or are no. they just my, my general behaviour in life? Not necessarily. No, no, not necessarily. As the example I gave earlier, um, the the one I found from England was where the solicitor had not paid six hundred and fifty pounds in train fares. And this was considered to be misconduct, and the solicitor was struck off the role of solicitors over there. Okay, and and if I find myself in that type of situation, is there any assistance that can be provided to me, or do I need le my own legal representation, or how, how would you advise people who find themselves? Because it can be a bit lonely if I found is, myself under investigation. A, a solicitor who has uh, is the subject of a complaint. Is it just a either or? Yeah, yeah. So a solicitor who's the subject of a complaint. There are a panel of solicitors available um, still through the society's website who may be able to assist solicitors or a solicitor may engage a solicitor of their own choosing if they feel they need to, uh, to address more serious complaints. But they may choose if they wish to address the complaint themselves. But one thing the authority has made very consistent throughout their um, six monthly reports is that they, sh they expect solicitors should engage with the process and they should correspond. Yeah. I'd say if you're running into difficulties, talk to other colleagues for sure and talk to other people That's just, just to find point. out what's happening. Yeah. So here, here are two parts to this question is like, I'm sitting out there and I've heard all this information, like what do I need to read or where do I need to go to kind of familiarize myself with some of these changes? And then what advertisements are sort of permitted under the new regulations? It, and I think um, the answer is the same. You need to read the, what, yeah, I, I would I would have a look at the um, 2020 regulations for advertising um, and I would just make sure they stay within the parameters. Uh, I think the real difficulty is because the society used to operate a pre-approval vetting service, which um, was great, the authority can't do so. And I think it's going to be very much for practitioners to to discover themselves what is the best way to uh, deal with advertising and legal services. So I've just added a link there on the chat to uh, the LSRA website on professional advertising and legal services. So it, it, it's a bit of a suck it and see. You need to familiarize, familiarize yourself with, with the regulations and then kind of interpret them there yourself. So you're, you're your own creator and then you're your own standards authority a little mm -hmm. bit for yourself. Is it, would that be fair to say? Oh, absolutely. I, I, would, I would say so. Uh, but like, generally speaking, Justin, uh, most solicitors always have stayed within the, the lines. There's been very few problems with advertisements over the years. Um, and I think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. So uh, a question there, will the LSRA be taking over education for solicitors in the future? Um, that's not something I would have clue about at all they they have conducted several reports on education and training of legal practitioners but um i don't think it's come to my attention before that they'd be taking over such training that's not to say they won't but it's not something i've ever heard of 
And just under this new inspections unit that's that's mm -hmm. ongoing, is is there a right to appeal in any of these situations, or is it undetermined at this stage? Um, I think it's all yet to be seen, um, because it hasn't actually commenced yet. I I, I think it's all remains to be seen, uh, Justin. It's uh, it's a wholly different uh, regime. So yeah. So I mean, we're coming up to a minute to go. Do you have any other like final words of wisdom for us, or? Are we going to be okay in this new situation? Do you think, or what's your what's your views on it? Well, everything it... changes, Justin. Um, but uh, you know, people be fine. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm happy to take any queries. Um, uh, as I say, my email address is there. Uh, if anyone wants to, if anyone has any pressing queries or any difficult queries, I'm sure I, I can try and look into them. Sure. So I've just shared my screen there. I don't know whether you can see it with just our, our two up, up and the final sessions for, for this autumn winter series. Next week, we've got Neil Kushnan from uh, Matt Matheson, who's going to be talking to us about the uh, introduction to a general scheme of companies and this new uh, small company administrative rescue process, um, which is a brand new bill. And then we've got a case management superior court rules. So there's been some changes to those superior court rules. And uh, uh, Garrett uh, Richardson from Visit Eagle is going to come in and talk to us about the, a solution he has for that, or just to make people aware of what's generally happening. I'll just also draw people's attention to the previous session we had with uh, the LSRA on limited liability partnerships. So, so Simon, thanks a million for joining us today. I don't think there's anything else for us to discuss at this stage. There is a, a, a last question there, which we'll, I think we'll just take very, very quickly, and uh, we'll have to, uh, unfortunately, uh, offline. So. Uh, so, hi, Simon, do you know if the LSRA are seeking to amend the admiss admissibility of complaints, it appears they are accepting complaints on almost anything. The solicitor is then left in a position of having to provide a response which takes time out of the solicitor. I, I haven't been advised of that now, to be honest. Um, it's something that hasn't come to my attention. So I actually don't know. I think it's, it, it's probably very much an internal matter for them how they, how they deal with the admissibility of complaints. Um, it wouldn't be something I would have a, a knowledge of nor purport to. Okay. Well, Simon, thanks a million for uh, joining Thank us today. You've been a good sport. Uh, we're out of time. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Hopefully you'll join us next week. Sloan, August Garmagot.